So my name is Annika Brown. I am with the Custer Gallatin National Forest, and I am the Assistant On-Scene Coordinator. For those of you not aware of that term, um, On-Scene Coordinator basically means Project Manager. So today I'm going to go over uh, the background of the site, uh, go over some problems caused by mining, the contamination issues we have at the site, our design challenges for our reclamation, why we chose to do landform design for our reclamation design, and then I'll show you some cool before and after photos of past work we've done and go over the vegetation monitoring results and then what future work we have out at the site and how we measure success at the site. So the site, Riley Pass is located um, in the far northwest corner of South Dakota. It is 25 miles north of Buffalo and just west of Ludlow. We have 12 bluffs at the site, um, kind of spread out in the North Cave Hills area, um, which you can see on that larger map there. So the geology of the site, um, the landscape looks a lot like this photo I have right here. Um, it's a nice flat, um, even sandstone cliffs um, and bluffs out at the site and then some rolling hills. Um, the Fort Union formation it is where the, um, we got the lignite beds that were mined in the 60s. So um, these are about 63 to 50 million years old. And um, yeah, mining first occurred at the site in the first prospecting occurred in the 1950s. And then mining happened from the early 1960s to 1964. And what they did was it was um, strip mining. So they just pushed off the overburden on top of the bluff, either to the bluff edge or over the bluff edge to get to the black lignite beds that they were after. Um, and then this was all done before modern reclamation laws were around. So when they stopped mining, they just walked away from the site and left it how it is. So, of course, um, resulting from mining, we have contamination. So the contaminants at the site are arsenic, molybdenum, selenium, uranium, radium, and thorium. So we've done some risk assessment at the site and determined that our cleanup goals are 30 picocuries per gram for radium-226 and 142 milligrams per kilogram of arsenic. If we focus on those two contaminants, we will also be addressing the other contaminants at the site at the same time. And then of course, um, in areas where there was mining, we have distressed vegetation. So here are some good examples of bare ground that's just been sitting there since the 60s and nothing's been growing. And then due to the, um, the high silt and clay content in the soil out there and the arid region, as well as the wind, um, we have a lot of erosion, especially, especially in areas where we don't have vegetation anchoring um, the soil down. And we get these really deep gullies um, that just go down, 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 just so deep. Uh, some of them are so deep that we've even lost cows in them. Um, so we're trying to address that. So I have a close up on the left side and then a zoomed out picture on the right side. Yeah. You can see this giant goalie right here. And then here's a good overview. Um, you have the, the mining overburden that was just pushed over right here. That's just all mucky and gross. And then what we're trying to do is clean this up, put it back on top of the bluff so that we can expose these beautiful sandstone cliffs that you can see in the surrounding area. Um, and these are just super steep. In some areas, they're uh, one to one. So really steep, not, not able to walk on them. And then also because of the soil out there, um, it's really prone to piping. So it's really unstable. It's hard to get equipment on certain areas. It's just dangerous. Um, and then because we have um, a high sodium adsorption ratio, it's really hard to get plants to grow out there. So our um, cleanup goals also include, our plan is to isolate the contaminated material, 
um, place this in on-site repositories. We cover this material with clean material, and then we anchor it with vegetation and stabilize the ground with vegetation, but also with um, landforms. And we're using natural landform design, which I'll get into more detail a little bit later. But basically, natural landform design incorporates features of the surrounding landscape um, so we can match that landscape, but also that provides us a good example of what the land surface eroded to. So we're trying to jumpstart the geomorphological processes, and so it'll be more stable in the future. We also have contamination issues out there. You can't see or smell evidence of high arsenic or radium concentrations. Um, also, lab analysis for radium um, is really expensive, and it takes about 30 days turnaround time to get those results back. So it's just not feasible to collect a bunch of soil samples to evaluate our um, how our cleanup is progressing while we have heavy equipment out there just sitting on site. It's really expensive. So what we do is we use field screening techniques. We use a gamma meter, which measures radioactivity, but that's in different units than um, our soil cleanup goal. So therefore we need to, we use field screening methods, but then we cross check it by collecting samples that we'll send out to the lab and make sure that we're meeting our cleanup goals. Also, there's no point source of contamination out there and there's no real pattern of contamination. So here I have on the left-hand side is an aerial photo. You can see the areas where there's no vegetation. Um, and then on the right-hand side, the pink indicates where the contaminated material is. Um, and you can see they're not totally the same. Although keep in mind the image with the pink outline, we didn't collect samples <clears throat> on those slopes because it just wasn't safe to get equipment out there and collect samples. So you have to incorporate that in as well. Um, we also need to provide direction to the contractors of where, where to clean up. So um, we're also planning on just taking all of the mining overburden off the side, even if it's not um, over our cleanup goals, but just picking that up and putting it then back on top of the bluff and encapsulating it. The higher concentrations are going deeper into the landform, so they're going to be buried deeper and isolated from human health and the environment. Then, of course, we have design challenges. So our design plan is to bring the site back to what it looked like pre-mining conditions. So that was pre-1954. We don't have a lot of data from 1954, but we do have a topo map that we've digitized. So the our plan is we kind of do a two-step process. So we excavate the contaminated material and then um, place those in repositories on the site. And then we resurvey that site and then design the landforms on top of those. So we ensure that the hottest material we place deep in those um, in those landforms, deep in those repositories. Also, um, we're trying to uncover that beautiful sandstone cap, but the sandstone isn't evident in all places. So we don't know what areas it's there and what areas it just happens to be missing because we can't, it's just not feasible to sample everything on the site. We have to kind of make guesses. Um, also, we have to estimate the thickness of mine waste. It's not even on all areas of the site. So we have to make assumptions of how deep we think it is, but that's definitely an issue we deal with in contracting and telling contractors how much material we think they're gonna have to move. Um, and then also our work season is from April to October. Um, so we have to make sure that everything is buttoned up and stabilized before winter comes. The reason we do that is because um, we the ground is frozen in the winter and we can't reach our compaction goals with frozen material. So we just perform work between April and October and then we do our design um, over the winter for the next season. And then why we're doing landform design. So basically landform design is replicating the features of the natural landscape. So 
our goal is at the end of this that you won't be able to tell what areas were reclaimed and what areas were just not mined. So we're looking at, um, well, natural, natural landform design emphasizes diverse surface topography. It has multiple slope angles and aspects, small drainage basins, and um, looking at natural stream morphology as well as differing vegetation patterns. And here's a good example of the same area at Riley Pass with two different designs. So on the left is traditional mine reclamation, and you can see there's really smooth, uniform slopes. We only have um, two drainage ditches. So these would be really <clears throat> strong and lined with riprap to make sure that they're stable. And um, then on the right is the natural landform design. And you can see there's at least 11 drainages and they're very sinuous and they're at a low angle. Um, and we don't have those uniform slopes. It really models the land in the surrounding landscape. So what we do is we collect data from unmined, undisturbed areas, um, such as stream sinuosity, um, slope aspect and angle. And we put this into a program in AutoCAD and that puts out a design. And then of course, once we have that design, we have to massage it to make sure it's constructible. It's, um, yeah, it's constructible. It fits our equipment. And then also in the areas where the the reclaimed area meets the undisturbed area, we need to make sure that that's going to be smooth because that's where a lot of um, failures happen is that meeting point between the reclaimed area and the un undisturbed. So challenges out there, as I've said before, it's very dry, it's very windy, um, water is a scarce resource. Um, and when we, we have to use water for dust suppression, um, but also we can't use too much because the water makes the ground really slippery, really sticky. I know you guys are all familiar with gumbo. So we, that, that's a challenge. So we like to start our work in the spring when the ground is, um, very moist and we don't have to use as much water for dust suppression. And then of course we have those really steep slopes that are extra slippery when they're wet. So because we have these really complex slopes, um, we've been using GPS controlled equipment instead of having surveyors on site. We'd have to have surveyors on site full time, or if we had to call them out for to survey an area that hadn't been done yet, they're over 150 miles away. So it would be really expensive just to have operators sitting around waiting to figure out what work they were going to be doing. So we used GPS controlled equipment, um, which helps make the process a lot faster. So basically we input the design into the computers in the cabs and then the operators know how and or how deep and where they need to excavate or where they need to fill. This is a map showing our 12 bluffs. Um, the red ones are areas that we have completed reclamation and the areas in yellow are the ones that we're still working on. Um, so the total site is over 300 acres, but um, re total unreclaimed is a little less than 197 that this chart shows because we've been working on Bluff B right here, which is the biggest. So um, Bluff B is about 153 acres. So it's going to take us several years to take care of that. Um, and I got some pictures. So here's Bluff G. Um, in the left-hand picture, this is the early stages of reclamation. They're using excavators to load up dump trucks to haul the waste to um, the repository. And then you can see in the bottom of the photo, we've constructed a road to facilitate um, transporting that material. In the right-hand picture is the completed um the reclaimed area, but without vegetation. And you can really see the detail of this complex topography um, slowing down that water as it drains off um, the side slopes of that butte. So here's a good before and after. So on the left side, this was after mining, but before any reclamation was done, you can see um, 
We just have a lot of erosion, no soil, no vegetation has grown. And then on the right-hand side is after reclamation, when the vegetation has grown in, there's probably between three and five, um, three to five years between these photos. And then bluff I, of course, on the left side is after mining, but before reclamation. And you can see that road had been constructed to transport material. And then on the right-hand side is um, after mining or after reclamation, once the vegetation has grown in. Here's a before picture of Bluff B. Um, we're working on this now, but you can just see the lack of vegetation and just the slumpy sides covering up those sandstone cliffs. This I took last year um, at Bluff B, and I think it's a really good example of, here's the unreclaimed area, and this is the nice, beautiful, clean soil. Um, all these stockpiles, th this was taken in the middle of reclamation. So they've built the landforms, but then they have all this stockpiled material on top with the clean material that they're gonna use as uh, the 18 inches of clean material that we put over all the landforms. So that's why it looks like that. So I don't have a final, final picture, but we did seed this area last year. Um, and I'm excited to see what it looks like this spring. Hopefully we get lots of plants growing with how wet it was last year. So then we are monitoring vegetation um, out at the site. And this table shows on the right-hand side, these are our comparison areas. And these are the undisturbed non-mined areas that we are using to compare natural vegetation at the site to our reclamation areas. So um, these areas are the reclaimed areas. And then on this side, the bluff name, along with the year that reclamation was completed and they were seeded. Um, the reason there's a line between 2020 well, 2020, 2021, and 22 and 23 is because we kind of changed our um, monitoring techniques. But even if you look at 22 and 2023, we have higher um, areas of cover versus non-cover, even compared to our comparison areas. So we're doing pretty good vegetation-wise. And then, of course, we're also... Another method of evaluation, we're using um, species richness and then um, species richness and diversity. Um, so once again, we have our comparison areas over here. These are our readings for the eight bluffs that we are currently monitoring. And you can see that our numbers are either the same or they're a little bit higher for our reclaimed areas versus our um, comparison areas. So we're pretty happy with it. Future work at the site. So as I said before, we have three um, remaining bluffs requiring reclamation. We're working on B, which is pretty big. We're gonna be working on it for a while. And then we also have bluffs H and L. And then as part of um, this reclamation, the work includes designing the excavation design. Where's the hottest material? And then our consolidation design. Where are we gonna put the hottest material? And then on top of that, we're designing the landforms to make the area more stable um, over time and indistinguishable from the surrounding landscape. And then, of course, on the bluffs that we've reclaimed so far, we're doing um, we're making sure that the vegetation is stable. We don't have a lot of invasive species coming in. Um, and we don't have a lot of slumping or erosion happening. Um, and then we're also monitoring sediment. So we're comparing the sediment that's eroded from Bluff B pre-reclamation. And then we're going to be taking measurements over time as we reclaim it and compare how much sediment is being eroded from Bluff B as we reclaim it and anchor that material with vegetation. And then, of course, we do site maintenance as needed, which is taking care of the roads at the site so we can access these different areas, dealing with culverts, dealing with um, spraying invasive weeds or planting trees in certain areas to kind of get everything to grow back.
So how do we measure success at the site? As I said before, we do verification sampling to make sure we're meeting our cleanup goals for the contamination at the site. Um, and then we're also monitoring sediment, which I showed you our tables of the last few years, um, making sure that we don't have invasive species taking over. And we say we have good vegetation growth, but it's really invasive species. We don't want those. So we want to get native um, plants there. And one thing I forgot to say earlier, it's taking um, two to three years for plants. Yeah, two to three years for the plants in our seed um, seed mix to really become established at the site. Um, and then we're doing the sediment monitoring, trying to monitor hopefully how much less erosion we have as we complete our reclamation and increase our vegetation growth. Um, and then of course, how's our vegetation over time? You might get, you know, the first year of reclaiming an area, as you guys probably all know, you might have a few dominant species, but then over time, more species will come up. So we'll have a good variety at the site. And then making sure that these landforms are stabilized and not failing. We don't have erosion. We don't have gullies forming. So making sure everything's really stabilized. And I think I probably have time for some questions. Yeah. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Can you clean uh, topsoil? Because this topsoil is pretty thin in the area and you, it looks like there's a very um, extensive project. You probably need a lot of clean cover. We actually, we so we've done some studies in the area on neighboring properties and we've identified um, cover borrow areas. So um, we've done a lot of testing in these areas, but they're they're just areas off the Forest Service land on private property where we have an agreement with the landowners to take that topsoil, which isn't great, but it's what's out there. So we're trying to really match the surrounding area. So we take that material and um, haul it from local areas. So we're not, we do um, amend that soil with some uh, compost that we do bring in. So that's imported in, but otherwise the most of the borrow is taken from neighboring areas. We haven't sampled the, in the reclaimed areas, we haven't sampled that vegetation, but we did before we started the work, we did do um, a risk assessment study and I'd have to go review that and I can, you have my contact information. So I can, I can get that to you, but we did um, evaluate that in our risk ass assessment. Um, um, can you explain again what you did with the hot stuff that you used and did you try to combine them into the different, like the same repository or did you do it pretty much on each butte? Generally on each butte, it kind of depended on our scope of work because I don't know if you, I'm sorry, we can go back. But I mean, we combined, let's see. So this is bluff C, D, and E, which just grew bigger and bigger that we just kind of combined it into one butte. Um, so that has one repository on it, even though it's three bluffs. But generally each bluff, we're pulling the material from the side and putting it on top, but then making sure we're encapsulating it deep enough that nobody's going to dig into it. And um, the the radioactive material is blocked by that clean cover soil that's on there. And then we do the sampling on top of that to make sure that all that material on that surface meets our cleanup goals. Does that answer it? Yeah. So I'm, I think I might have missed it. You, you pull it up on top of you. Is that where you? Yes. Okay. Cause that's where it originally came from okay. when they were mining, they just scraped off that top and pushed it to the edge of the bluff or off the side of it. So we're putting it all back where it started. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.